happy to be here today representing the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance. Uh, my name is Anusha Yeshukumar, and I'm a neurologist uh, here at uh, Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, I wanted to first talk a little bit about the Alliance and some of the things that we're doing that might be helpful for patients and for, for um, providers to refer their patients to, and then uh, present a little bit of data on a study that we did in, um, in collaboration with the Alliance. Um, so the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance was founded in 2012 by um, two particular families who uh, had been affected by autoimmune encephalitis. And these families, I think, really recognized the importance of early recognition, early consideration, um, both in terms of uh, potentially improving recovery, but also just in um, improving quality of life for, for patients and their families. Um, and so they desired to establish the supportive community of patients and families across the country. So uh, really the mission is sort of threefold. One is to educate physicians. One is to establish a supportive community for patients and their families. Um, and the third is to facilitate scientific research. So just to go through these very briefly, um, in terms of uh, physician education, the Alliance does um, facilitate certain med medical education efforts. These include Grand Rounds and Symposia, uh, and also really wants to increase uh, autoimmune encephalitis awareness uh, amongst first-line physicians. So one of the initiatives that we've come out with, I believe was launched yesterday actually, um, is, a, is a new initiative to, to sort of educate psychiatrists around the country, both about the, the pivotal role they play in recognition and diagnosis, but also in management and treatment of AE. So in terms of patients and caregivers, uh, we um, uh, have an AE clinicians network, and I do encourage providers in the audience who are not uh, a part of the network to go on the website and, and register for this. Um, and this enables patients and their families to find providers in their area. Um, we also have a Smart Patients Online AE community, um, which was just created in September of 2018 uh, and really is building good membership uh, between patients, families, and caregivers. Uh, we also have a, a small but dedicated staff that does respond to individual inquiries to help uh, connect patients and their families to physicians and, and other resources. And then in terms of research, uh, uh, recognizing the sort of importance of collaboration, um, the Alliance is very interested in improving care and treatment for those affected by AE. And this effort is um, spearheaded by the Medical Advisory Board that was established in 2017. Um, that really strives to press forward research on treatment protocols um, and to ensure that any information that's put out by the Alliance uh, is medically sound information. Here's our medical advisory board, and as you can see, we have 18 members, uh, including Martin Titulaire, who's here today. Uh, and our board, and uh, our board is made up of rheumatologists, neurologists, psychiatrists, uh, both from around the country and around the world as well. Uh, and here's our website on the bottom, which again I do uh, recommend that you check out and, and uh, feel free to refer patients to as well. Um, so again, in my in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about some of the collaborative research that we've done. Um, with our group here at Mount Sinai, uh, with the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance, and also with the Encephalitis Society. And so last summer, I had two fantastic medical students who are here today um, uh, who were really interested in looking at um, things that we could sort of explore with patients with autoimmune and infectious encephalitides. Uh, and so one of the students, Raya, uh, was very interested in looking at psychosocial outcomes and the role of mental health. And she administered um, a survey called the PROMISE tool that looks at the impact that this illness plays on people's psychosocial outcomes. And then Amanda uh, was interested in looking at caregivers and what their experiences are. And so she administered the care transitions measure, which looks at how well we're preparing patients and their families for the transition from the hospital to the outpatient world. And also the Zaret Burden interview, which looks at caregiver burden uh, of, from taking care of an individual with AE. Um, so here's Raya down at the bottom. Um, and so the first thing that she wanted to look at was uh, misdiagnosis, rates and sort of patterns with this. And what she found, perhaps not surprising um, to the, the group here, was that patients with autoimmune encephalitis were much more likely to receive an initial misdiagnosis than patients with an infectious encephalitis. And this was particularly true for psychiatric misdiagnoses. Uh, and for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to focus in the interest of time on our results from the anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis cohort, um, because it was the most common cohort um, in this study. 
And so what she found was that about 60% of the individuals who completed our survey did report a misdiagnosis. And again, perhaps not surprisingly, this was most commonly a psychiatric diagnosis such as bipolar, schizophrenia, or depression. When we looked at the negative impact of this illness on psychosocial outcomes, she found that patients with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis had a higher score or a worse psychosocial outcome uh, as compared to uh, a population of patients with a chronic illness. And this is on average more than four years out from their initial diagnosis. She wanted to look at factors that were associated with worse outcomes and found, uh, as we found in other studies, that a lower age of symptom onset the presence of seizures, and the presence of other neuropsychiatric symptoms were associated with worse outcomes, um, as was the presence of a psychiatric comorbidity or current ongoing use of psychotropic medications. So um, in the survey, they, um, the, the PROMISE survey asks patients to compare sort of pre and post illness um, to the best of their memory. And the items that received the sort of greatest mean change from before to after illness were worry about health interferes with my life, feeling isolated from others, and worrying about the future. Um, as a secondary outcome, she wanted to look at whether patients were returning to work or school. And while all of the participants in the study reported working or attending school prior to illness, almost a third had not returned after uh, encephalitis. And again, this was on average more than four years after symptom onset. And of those who did return to work or school, nearly a third of them were receiving accommodations. And of those who did not return to work or school, nearly half were receiving government assistance. Again, looking at the factors that were associated with uh, an increased likelihood of not returning, she found that receiving an initial misdiagnosis or not having psychiatric follow-up were associated with an increased risk of not returning. Um, and I know we've talked about sort of the importance of this this afternoon and sort of bridging neurology and psychiatry, but at least in this study, what we found sort of interesting but alarming as well was that while nearly every patient did have follow-up with a neurologist, only about a third ever had a follow-up with psychiatry after leaving the hospital. Uh, and then to move on to Amanda's work looking at uh, the caregiver survey, we looked at the items on the care transitions measure that caregivers expressed the greatest disagreement with, with respect to making that transition from the inpatient to the outpatient world. And what she found was that the majority of patients um, uh, d disagreed with the statement that they had a readable and easily understood written plan that described how their healthcare needs were going to be met. And over half did not feel confident about what to do with their, to manage their health, um, and did not have a good understanding of their health condition and what makes it better or worse. Uh, when she looked at caregiver burden uh, on average, uh, caregivers reported scores that fell into the moderate to severe burden. Uh, and again, this was exactly four years out from symptom onset on average. And again, sort of factors that were associated with worse caregiver burden included uh, when the individual had ongoing seizures or other neuropsychiatric issues. When we looked at the items that, were, that caregivers reported the greatest burden with, uh, we found that they were afraid of what the future holds for their relative, that they felt stressed between caring for the relative and trying to meet their other responsibilities, and feeling that they did not have enough time for themselves with the time that they were spending with the relative they were caring for. So just to sort of summarize all this, um, you know, we do acknowledge that this is, of course, a biased sample when we're looking at uh, um, uh, members of, of organizations. But I do think that the, that the themes that we found are very relevant and also very actionable. So we found that mental health does matter and is associated with outcomes after encephalitis. The presence of ongoing neuropsychiatric issues is associated with worse outcomes. And those who saw a psychiatrist are more likely to return to work and school. We also found that caregivers provide important insight into outcomes after encephalitis. And perhaps that if we were to think about interventions that target care transitions and caregivers, we could improve outcomes for both patients and caregivers with encephalitis. And so our next steps um, working with the Alliance is to, is to come up with some strategies to target these, again, very actionable items.